I want to thank Brian Griffith for arranging this. I really appreciate it. This talk is going to be an attempt to encapsulate the main observations, conclusions, and train of thought that is presented in the New Human Rights Movement, which was published earlier this year by Ben Bella Books. This work has 800 endnotes, a project that took about two years, so what I'm going to talk about today will naturally be rather general. In summary, there are certain key concepts that will be helpful to introduce up front. The first has to do with context. While the book's title clearly suggests activism and social change, specifically the need for economic change, the study itself is that of public health. And economic change at this day and age is going to be required if we expect to improve public health for the future. To clarify, public health is an umbrella term that not only refers to the physical health of a population, such as the occurrence of, say, a communicable disease occurring in a local water supply, for example, but also the psychological and mental health, including human behavior, such as violence and drug addiction. To give some modern examples, in 2014, the people of Flint, Michigan, experienced a polluted water crisis where well over 100,000 people were exposed to high levels of lead, causing sickness. This is probably one of the most obvious and straightforward examples of a public health concern that we hear about. A more complex example is the current opioid crisis, which is killing about 100 people every day due to addiction, complications, and misguided use. This is certainly a public health crisis, but is notably different than the Flint water crisis because it involves deliberate, individual human behavior. In other words, the people of Michigan realizing their water is polluted could make a conscious decision, assuming they could afford it, to move and find other water sources. Drug addiction, on the other hand, involves people engaging knowingly, knowing that it can be fatal, with the power of that compulsive addiction compelling them to repeat those behaviors. And a third example, which I have deliberately included here since it's incomprehensibly complex, but still has roots that can be, can be found, it fits the characteristic of a public health problem for sure, and that is violence, which the US, of course, leads the way in, in the developed world. And a particularly troubling version of this violence is now the trademarked rise of semi-indiscriminate mass murder, as we witnessed last Sunday in Texas, and a month before in Las Vegas, and so on. A trend that seems to have taken root around the 1980s, when people were, quote, going postal, as they would say. In effect, any negative pattern we see occurring consistently over time in relevant numbers across a given population is effectively a public health concern. And by aggregating a great deal of epidemiological research in numerous areas, the conclusion of the new human rights movement is that our economy, the market system of economics, call it what you want, while on one side, of course, facilitating the general life support that we see, is at the same time deeply inefficient and dysfunctional, producing extended negative problems that are unnecessary. So much so that from the broadest perspective, the economy itself its core system processes, internal logic, incentives, and so on, it has become the greatest public health threat humanity has ever known due to how outdated and incompatible this system has become in the 21st century. That may seem, of course, like an extreme statement, considering the system has been accelerating production efficiency, as we know, since the Industrial Revolution, again, facilitating the goods and services we all rely on. People who defend the market economy these days love to tout all the apparent successes of the system beyond that on higher sociological levels, if you will, such as higher historical incomes over time, increased lifespan in general, reduced poverty, decreased child mortality, and so on, as though such general improvements, many of which, by the way, are actually quite exaggerated, as we can talk about in the Q&A, justify the litany of other highly negative, unnecessary outcomes. And part of the problem is that these negative outcomes, while often recognized independently, are rarely attributed to their systemic source. In this, symptoms of a larger order problem simply appear as though they are causes themselves. And it's understandable, since we humans really do have a hard time thinking in a systemic way. Our minds tend to organize things very categorically, linearly, and superficially. Systemic thinking, probabilistic thinking, recognizing and understanding extended, nonlinear causalities, these things do not come naturally to us, and hence the need for interdisciplinary epidemiological research that comprises, again, a great deal of this book. And there are two formal areas of study I wish to mention. 
areas that combined give us a more thorough picture of the human condition, which, more specific to the context of this presentation, allow us to better understand the effects of our man-made social systems, such as the economy, the effect it has on the individual, how that translates into society as a whole, again, in terms of public health. And these are sociology and behavioral biology. Behavioral biology is the study of not only how genetics, hormones, neurochemistry, and other biological factors affect behavior, but it's also how behavior and environment can affect one's biology. The way you experience, interpret, and react to the world, the stressors you experience in different periods of life greatly affect your physiology, hormones, and regulatory developmental functions. Sociology, on the other hand, is more macro, studying the evolution, nature, and influence of social structures, institutions, belief systems, and how individuals, groups, and these overarching social conventions interplay. And when you synergize these two areas of study, linking behavioral biology and sociology, a much more robust model of public health analysis emerges. As a quick example, a 2015 Columbia University study found that cognitive impairment, a biological issue, correlates to poverty, a sociological issue, in the form of effectively brain damage. It showed that the brain structure of children and teenagers in poverty actually differ from those in affluent conditions. It was the largest study of its kind, not trivial, focusing on areas of the brain related to functions such as language, reading, and decision making. And it revealed that children and families earning less than $25,000 a year had, on average, 6% less development than those making over $150,000 a year. A similar study found that poverty overall correlates to a reduction of cognitive capacities and subsequently a reduction in IQ. The study found that financial stress, worrying and the release of cortisol in the system, that financial stress was able to create a cognitive deficit equivalent to the loss of 13 IQ points. And these examples are just the tip of the iceberg in terms of evidence that low socioeconomic status or poverty has a direct influence on people's cognitive capacities not to mention physical and mental health, as I will touch upon later in this presentation. The point here, put in more traditional epidemiological terms, is that the human being is a biopsychosocial entity. Our individual health, and ultimately the aggregate health of society, is a product of the interplay between our autonomous biology, our active psychology, and the social and environmental influences that engage us. And when it comes to problem solving, when it comes to trying to improve the quality of our lives and society, we are left with really only one area of focus, and that is the social environment. Why? Because that is something we can actually change. Biological evolution is, of course, an extremely slow process. Despite the rhetoric of folks like Ray Kurzweil and transhumanism, science is nowhere near understanding how we can modify our biology for the better or our evolutionary psychology to overcome hardwired negative biological propensities. Nor, by the way, do I think that would even be necessary. But what we can do is change the way society works, accentuating and attenuating those social pressures and influences that bring out the best or the worst of our so-called human nature. For example, research in behavioral biology has found that in-group, out-group loyalties which are very ubiquitous across all primate species, extremely ubiquitous, how we separate ourselves and do it quite rapidly, whether it's a sports team or a nation and so on, from loyalty to one's family, to one's tribe or nation, to one's race, religion, or ideological group. This tendency is no doubt universally present in human beings, with identifiable hormonal and other biological interactions that in fact guide that propensity. But as with many hardwired evolutionary tendencies, often the purpose and utility moves from positive to negative as social conditions change. We have to ask ourselves how productive reactionary, groupistic bias and loyalties really are in our deeply interconnected technological age. An age that is also being slowly torn apart, if you pay attention, by socioeconomic inequality and chaotic economic behavior and decline triggering confusion and anger, with people scrambling to figure out which minority or religious or national group to blame and hate. This is an extremely dangerous tendency in the 21st century, 
fueling intergroup competition that can only be destructive in the long run. And my main point here is that if we humans have this innate divisive elitist tendency for whatever out of date evolutionary reason, it is critical we work to create a sociological condition that reduces that conflict generating, bigoted, racist, jingoistic propensity. In other words, to use a public health term, we need to create a new social precondition. A precondition that in effect strategically brings out the best tendencies of the human condition, suppressing the worst. And for the sake of clarity, a precondition, simple to define, precondition to driving a car would be to obtain a driver's license. It's something that comes before. Medically, it's used to denote factors that lead to a statistically probable outcome, such as smoking tobacco leading to lung cancer. And sociologically, the term is used similarly. But as opposed to an individual's health, the context is again public health. And perhaps the best example of the power and merit of changing social and environmental preconditions is the case study of bonobos and chimpanzees. Chimpanzees and bonobos are almost identical in their genetic makeup. They came from the same origin about a million years ago. They also happen to be the closest living genetic relatives to humans by about 99%. About a million years ago, an origin group of these two ape species got divided, speculated by the Congo River in Africa, and each began to thrive in very different environmental conditions, one more abundant, one more scarce. And as a result, they manifested extremely different social behaviors. Bonobo troops living in lush, or I should say thriving at the time in lush, rain, abundant rainforests, developed patterns of low aggression and conflict Females in the alpha roles, very diverse sexual behavior, and other pro-social, slightly more egalitarian characteristics. In stark contrast, chimpanzee troops, evolving in more difficult, scarce landscapes with males in the alpha roles, have consistent conflict both in and out of the group, are highly competitive and territorial, militantly stratified, with extensive sexual regimentation based on stratification. Yet again, these two species today are genetically almost identical, highlighting the power of environment. And while no doubt more complex, similar research has been done on human culture, linking characteristics of different groups to different geographical environmental exposures over long periods of time. This field of study has been termed cultural anthropology and was notably made famous by Stanford anthropologist Robert Texter in his work, A Cross-Cultural Summary. His extensive research found that cultures spawn from resource-scarce desert regions are more prone to monotheism, conflict, stratification, male dominance, and female oppression, while cultures originating from lush, abundant rainforest regions are more prone to polytheism, egalitarianism, fewer sexual taboos, improved women's rights, and less conflict. This is a fairly consistent phenomenon, and we see, of course, paralleled Albeit, it's hard to use primate analogs in an extremely literal way, but the bonobo and chimp comparison is, is a very unique thing to learn from. And it gives insight as to what it means to exist in a scarce environment and an abundant environment. And one of the most important messages of the new human rights movement is that if we can foster a social precondition that reduces scarcity stress, reduces our struggle to simply survive, hence reducing the prevalence of injustice, group antagonism, oppression, conflict, exploitation, and abuse, hence the reduction or elimination of socioeconomic inequality, we might have a chance of not destroying ourselves as our technology advances faster than our maturity. And what this means is we have to change the very nature of our economy once again. Likewise, the second most important message of the new human rights movement is that the economic premise of our society is completely oblivious to what earthly sustainability means. As I'll argue, all of the common sense economic requirements that would ensure that we do not ruin our habitat, and hence ourselves, are basically opposed, structurally opposed, to what is required to keep the market system of economics going. In fact, the idea of a truly efficient, preserving, sustainable, ecologically respectful economy and society is characteristically the opposite of what our market system requires to operate fluidly, as I will explain. These two issues, the need to create a new social precondition that fosters intergroup respect and peaceful coexistence, along with organizing our survival in a way that is actually sustainable, again, is the heart of the new human rights movement. 
And it will be only through large-scale, revolutionary, structural economic change that we can ever expect this to occur. And before I go into specifics as to why the structure of the market economy, or what we call capitalism or whatnot, is fundamentally flawed and incompatible with life in the 21st century, I first want to step back and consider how we got here to begin with. Roughly 12,000 years ago, the human species transitioned from nomadic hunter-gatherer societies, tribes foraging and hunting with no agricultural skills or knowledge, to farm cultivating settled societies. This has been termed the Neolithic Revolution. Before the Neolithic Revolution, as corroborated by numerous anthropologists that have studied both historical and still existing hunter-gatherer societies, social and economic life very, very different. Small bands or tribes operated without money or markets. In fact, 99% of human history didn't have money or markets. They were egalitarian with no economic dominance hierarchy. It's also well established they had much less violence and certainly no large-scale warfare. Economically, what they had is what we call today a gift economy, where they share with no direct expectation of reciprocation. There are even modern stories of outsiders in the early 20th century being given handicrafts from existing hunter-gatherer tribes, only to feel the need, of course, to give something in return, as many in our market culture, reciprocal society does. And this reciprocal behavior was considered offensive by the tribe as they felt the exchange was a refusal of friendship. British anthropologist Tim Ingold highlights that the difference between giving and exchange has to do with a social perception based around autonomous companionship and involuntary obligation. He states, clearly both hunter-gatherers and agricultural cultivators depend on their environments, but whereas for cultivators, this dependency is framed within a structure of reci reciprocal obligation. For hunter-gatherers, it rests on the recognition of personal autonomy. The contrast is between relationships based on trust and those based on domination. In other words, it's an, and it's an extremely profound contrast. It takes a while to sink in, frankly. Hunter-gatherer societies operate with a kind of trust of their environment and each other to make things work, a trust that removes the imposition of involuntary obligation. If you think deeply about that and how we in modern culture, how we tend to react when somebody does something for us, very often we react by wanting to do something immediately in reciprocation for them. Not necessarily because it's a good thing to do, but it removes a psychological sense of indebtedness when we do so. And that is a cultural phenomenon that we've created. Hunter-gatherers avoided this. It wasn't that they weren't dependent on each other for contribution, but the egalitarian nature of things, including the minimalistic affluence they had, a very unique point as well. The idea of affluence, of course, we think of giant mansions and so on, but it's really a state of mind and making sure your needs are met. And everything beyond that becomes quite subjective. But including the minimalistic affluence they had, meaning life was not this relentless battle with scarcity for survival, as many have assumed back in this period of time. Allowing for, again, a very different culture one that provided for the members of the groups without the pressure of obligatory exchange and effectively pattern of dominance. In the words of anthropologist Marshall Salins, contrasting the affluent minimalism of hunter-gatherer society to our modern scarcity-based market society states, to accept that hunter-gatherers are affluent is therefore to recognize that the present human condition of man slaving to bridge the gap between his unlimited wants and his insufficient means is a tragedy of modern times. Modern capitalist societies, however richly endowed, dedicate themselves to the proposition of scarcity. Inadequacy of economic means is the first principle of the world's wealthiest peoples. The market industrial system institutes scarcity in a manner completely without parallel, where production and distribution are arranged to the behavior of prices, and all livelihoods depend on getting and spending. Insufficiency of material means becomes the explicit, calculable starting point of all economic activity. And as a corollary to that, in the words of neuroscientist Robert Sapolsky, hunter-gatherers had thousands of wild sources of food to subsist on. Agriculture changed all that, generating an overwhelming reliance on a few dozen food sources. Agriculture allowed for the stockpiling of surplus resources and thus, inevitably, the unequal stockpiling of them. Stratification of society and the invention of classes. Thus, it has allowed for the invention of poverty. 
The Neolithic Revolution set in motion the framework of the world we have today through a kind of geographical determinism, in fact. The central characteristics of what underscores our now highly competitive, highly unequal, market-driven society were codified as this transition occurred. Put in terms of modern political economy, it gave birth to the basis of property ownership, capital means of production, labor specialization, jobs, regulation, government, and protection, law, police, military. In other words, the foundation of what we call, in effect, the market system of economics. While we can debate the characteristics of prior social systems, such as abject slavery, feudalism, mercantilism, and even historical communism, all large-scale social approaches since the Neolithic Revolution have been based around these features to one degree or another. It has also created what I call in the book the root socioeconomic orientation of our society, which is one based upon scarcity again with competition, dominance incentives, narrow self-interest, and hence a sociology effectively rooted in fear and in-group and out-group bias. And naturally, since this time, given the influence of this new organizing structure, basically creating a kind of social psychology that permeates the public, the scarcity and protectionist worldview has fostered entire moral philosophies. In fact, I'm unaware of any highly regarded historical figure that has discussed the issue of political economy that really deviates from the idea that it is natural for us to fight and abuse each other, survival of the fittest. And there will always be poverty because that's just the way the world is. It's scarce. In fact, Thomas Hobbes, considered the father of political philosophy in the 16th century, famously stated, the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. The condition of man is a condition of war of everyone against everyone. An extremely bleak, cynical perspective. And then when Thomas Malthus came along in the 18th century, he built upon this cynicism going so far to suggest that any attempts to alleviate poverty, such as programs by the state, poor laws, and so on in Europe, should end. He considered the existence and fatality of the poor as a law of nature, and hence there would always be part of the human species that must be sacrificed effectively for the greater good. This value system was compounded less than a century later when Charles Darwin composed the seminal Origin of Species, only this time people simply projected into his theory culminating a completely contrived concept of what we term social Darwinism. That, on the surface, seemed to justify existing elitism, scarcity-based political and economic philosophies, and so on. All of that noise that had been generated in assumptions was codified, so to speak, by Darwin, not him himself, but the bastardized interpretation of his theories. And hence, also justifying inequality and poverty and consequently conquest, colonialism, subjugation, imperialism, and so on. All of this was born from the grand economic, which is in fact a technical shift, known as the Neolithic Revolution. In other words, if we were to go back in time and interview existing hunter-gatherer societies, even probably ones that are maybe still around today in the Amazon, I guarantee you nobody would be describing life in the terms that Western philosophy has come up with because they live in a completely different type of social system. This is a figure by economic historian Gregory Clark. It charts the average incomes of people from 1000 BCE to the modern age. And that oscillating equilibrium you see on the left could really go back to about 10,000 years ago and effectively the Neolithic Revolution. He refers to this period appropriately enough as the Malthusian trap. This Malthusian trap refers to this eon-long inability to substantially increase incomes, or resource consumption, of the overall population, resulting in little expansion of overall human well-being or population growth before the 19th century, or the Industrial Revolution. Population could only expand so far due to insurmountable scarcity and lack of means inherent to the new economic mode of agriculture, causing die-offs. After the die-offs, things would even out a little bit, only to have the process repeat over and over again. This locked income and population growth into a cycle of expansion and contraction. Clark states, indeed in 1800, the bulk of the world's population was poorer than their remote ancestors. The lucky denizens of wealthy societies, such as 18th century England, managed a material lifestyle equivalent to that of the Stone Age. 
but the vast swath of humanity in East and South Asia eked out a living under conditions probably significantly poorer than those of cavemen. The average hunter-gatherer had a diet and a work life much more varied than the typical English worker of 1800. Hunter-gatherer societies are egalitarian, and material consumption varies little across their members. In contrast, inequality was pervasive in the agrarian economies that dominated the world in 1800. Generally speaking, the result of the Neolithic Revolution in terms of public health was really quite poor because it generated immediate poverty and inequality. The rich owners of land gained massively, while the general population toiled in class inequality. And it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, or what Clark calls the Great Divergence, that incomes rapidly increased, along with production, efficiency, the develop development of mechanization, the discovery of oil. The Industrial Revolution broke the Malthusian trap, and since then, the very fabric of our society has been changing rapidly as the advancement of science and technology plows forward. And in this incredible phase, a transitional phase, in fact, that we're all in right now, the internal logic that has justified the existence of market capitalism is collapsing. I'd like to cover some incompatibilities. The first incompatibility I want to address, something that's being talked about quite a bit these days, is the rise of technological unemployment, humans being replaced by machine, in other words. As per market logic, if it is more cost efficient to automate a job rather than hire a person, it is simply a matter of time before humans are replaced as companies compete for lower prices and market share. And it will happen because the advancement of technology and the means of production is going to continue moving in the, in the direction of what's been termed ephemeralization or more with less. R. Buckminster Fuller called this phenomenon ephemeralization, and it has to do with the completely counterintuitive reality that we are able to increase efficiency to the extent where we're using less resources at the exact same time with greater power and versatility, more with less. Our intuition, of course, tends to be very arithmetic. If you need an engine to be more powerful than a prior engine, we intuitively expect that engine to be larger, heavier, and use more resources. Today, the opposite is true. And I'll be returning to this phenomenon of ephemeralization in a moment, as it is the most important most important economic trend in human history. So returning to my main point, the market economy is based upon cyclical consumption and labor for income. That's its framework. If machines replace human labor, it throws a massive wrench into the gears of capitalism. The second incompatibility, which is very similar as it relates to the market's need for demand, consumption, and growth once again, is that years ago, production was indeed quite difficult and arduous. 300 years ago, a shoemaker might produce maybe a few pairs of decent shoes a day. Today, a common automated shoe factory can produce a pair every 30 seconds or 4,000 a day. This move towards mass production and abundance was very alarming to the early industrialists about 100 years ago. And rather than see the merit of this from a social progressive standpoint, with perhaps the reduction of the work week or work day to compensate, perhaps even lowering costs, respectively, to try and create more socioeconomic equality. Instead, the opposite was done, which was to push to make goods with shorter lifespans for repeat purchases, planned obsolescence, along with cultivating a culture of consumerism. In 1927, Paul Mazur of Lehman Brothers famously wrote in the Harvard Business Review, we must shift America from a needs to a desires culture. People must be trained to desire to want new things even before the old have been entirely consumed. We must shape a new mentality in America. Man's desires must overshadow his needs. Charles F. Kettering, the head of research at General Motors, wrote a famous article in the National Business Magazine in 1929 on the heels of the Great Depression titled, Keep the Consumer Dissatisfied. In this, he argued for the merit of consumer dissatisfaction as a force of his, in his view, social progress within a market, of course stating change to a research engineer's improvement. People, though, don't seem to think of it in that manner. When a change is suggested, they hold back and say, well, what we have is all right, it does the work. We as manufacturers must offer those improvements after they have been found to be capable improvements. The public buys and disposes of what it has. If everyone were satisfied, no one would buy the new thing because no one would want it. The ore wouldn't be mined, timber wouldn't be cut, and almost immediately hard times would be upon us. 
you must accept this reasonable dissatisfaction with what you have and buy the new thing or accept hard times. You can have your choice. And if anyone is interested in this painfully myopic perspective, it's completely contrary to sustainability and public health and healthy psychology, I suggest um, a book by Elizabeth Cohen called A Consumer's Republic, which catalogs this grotesque transition we went from a fairly puritanical view, a conservative view in a traditional sense, to one of, of robust consumption. They even talked about after World War II that this consumerism was a right, excuse me, a, a loyalty issue of America. And if you were to engage this consumerism, you would help defeat the communists and fuel the American dream. This brings me <clears throat> to the third incompatibility, democracy itself. I think the problem was best stated by Robert Lind, referencing America, in the foreword of a book written in 1943 called Business as a System of Power. Thus, political equality under the ballot was granted on the unstated but factually double-locked assumption that the people must refrain from seeking the extension of that equality to the economic sphere. In short, the attempted harmonious marriage of democracy to capitalism doomed genuine popular control from the start. And all down to our national life, the continuance of the union has depended upon the unstated condition that the dominant member, capital, continue to provide returns to all elements in democratic society sufficient to disguise the underlying conflict and interests. This crisis within the economic relations of capitalism was bound to precipitate a crisis in the democratic political system. One of the most interesting cultural biases we see in our society is that while the vast majority continue to you know, clamor for general equality, general race equality, creed equality, and so on, it's been a general trend. Most people agree with this kind of thing. Everyone seems to stop short when demanding anything along the lines of economic equality. Have you ever noticed this? While it is a fundamental value of democratic society with its basis in civil and human rights, People have been persuaded that economic equality is just off limits and somehow morally wrong. And to promote such a thing means, paradoxically, you must hate freedom and maybe be a communist. This social psychology, born from years of pro-business, pro-slavery, pro-inequality propaganda, has had a powerful effect. And the truth is, there is basically no real civil equality in society without economic equality. You are only as free as your purchasing power will allow you to be. And the very fact that it is blatantly obvious globally, beyond any doubt, that business runs government, or better yet, business is government, should be a signpost that capitalist societies gravitate constantly and consistently, even though it gets pushed back by forces that are trying to look, look forward, gravitates constantly and consistently towards something called fascism. What is a business model? It's a top-down dictatorial structure where the boss or the owner imposes directives while employees abide. Top-down control, bottom-up responsibility. And to think this dominant structure that is the root of basically the, the degree of survival and public health that we have would not carry over into the realm of the so-called democratic process is, is insanely absurd and naive. A detailed 2014 study conducted by Professor Martin Gillins of Princeton and Benjamin Page of Northwestern University concluded that, unsurprisingly, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. The researchers concluded that lawmakers' actions tend to support the interests of the wealthy, Wall Street, and big corporations. In fact, if we were to be consistent as a society, it's actually quite poor form to object to money power being in control at all. We should let the Koch brothers buy and run America. Why not? It is the purest and most natural outcome in a system where everything is for sale. To assume government would be off limits or not used for the differential advantage of big business, as, as though some kind of moral superiority is going to transcend the social psychology and incentives, is completely delusional as far as I'm concerned. Get money out of politics, they say. And the fourth and final incompatibility I'll mention, which is by far the most critical at this time, is the fact that you cannot have an economy, an economy driven by cyclical consumption, 
where you have to power demand through more purchases, an insatiable desire, economic growth, and ever expect there to be ecological sustainability. Many years ago, before the Industrial Revolution, the idea of resource overshoot, uh, catastrophic pollution, was really a remote concern. We simply didn't have the technological capacity to harm the ecosystem and overconsume in the way we do now. And today, it's the exact opposite. Headlines like the EPA's latest threat to economic growth. <laughs> it highlights the fact that any interest in preservation, sustainability, and true efficiency is antithetical to what the market requires to keep society moving on its own terms, keeping people employed, and so on. As Dr. Leanne Broadhead, professor of political science at Cape Brenton University, puts it well, economic growth in the organization of international society around the goals of efficient capital mobility and the profit margin its controllers seek are inherently anti-ecological. Anyway, it is looked at the extraction of raw materials for the manu manufacturing of goods, the demand for which in many cases has been artificially created, does not lead to an ecologically sound existence. No amount of masking the reality with talk of environmentally friendly technologies will offset the destructiveness of the growth ethic when the resounding failure of the technological fix is taken into consideration. And this leads us into the next section, negative externalities. The market economy in the 21st century can be thought of as a machine with two outputs, the products and the waste. On one side, you have the sea of goods and services. On the other side, you have this vast spectrum of waste, destruction, and social deficiency, in fact, we call a negative economic externality. To clarify, a negative economic externality is defined as a consequence, a negative consequence, of an economic activity that is experienced by unrelated third parties. In other words, they are consequences that are not accounted for by business or the industries that create them. A common example is pollution. A 2015 report by the International Monetary Fund put the external costs, the financial value of this, of fossil fuel at $5.3 trillion a year. That is the cost of trying to fix all of the ecological and public health systemic problems associated with fossil fuel production and use that isn't factored into the actual price of this resource. And that's just one industry. And the real world, world result of all of this is that virtually every life support system on this planet is now in decline and things are only getting worse. Open up any peer review journal and try to find anything positive about our ecological state or the trends, I challenge you to try. Climate change, biodiversity loss, resource overshoot, land, soil, water pollution, species extinction, you name it, it's all trending into the red. A 2011 study published by the journal Marine Ecology Analyzing resource overshoot in tandem with biodiversity loss concluded, the excess use of the Earth's resources or overshoot is possible because resources can be harvested faster than they can be replaced. The cumulative overshoot from the mid-1980s to 2002 resulted in an ecological debt that would require 2.5 planet Earths to pay. In a business as usual scenario, our demands on planet Earth could mount to the productivity of 27 planets by 2050. But my favorite of all is the 2010 Convention of Biological Diversity Report. In 2002, 192 countries got together and agreed in good spirit to try and slow biodiversity loss, only to come back eight years later completely defeated, stating, none of the 21 sub-targets accompanying the overall target of significantly reducing the rate of biodiversity loss by 2010 can be said definitively to have been achieved globally actions to promote biodiversity receive a tiny fraction of funding compared to infrastructure and industrial developments. Moreover, biodiversity concerns are often ignored when such developments are designed. Most future scenarios project continuing high levels of extinctions and loss of habitats throughout this century. Does anyone see the punchline in there? Because I love it. Well, of course it received a tiny fraction of funding compared to infrastructure and development projects and industrial developments because preserving biodiversity does nothing to feed the structural appetite of the market economy. You can't generate growth by not using something. So I could go on and on depressing you all with research of all the negative externalities affecting our habitat, such as the fact that air pollution alone today is killing over six million people a year. But now I want to extend the context into areas less talked about. 
A negative externality in a broader sense is really anything that can be systemically linked to the economy, including poverty and socioeconomic inequality, along with all the public health detriments associated with those two issues. Given that six people today have acquired more wealth than one half of the world's population in an outrageous display of market-generated inequality, coupled with the dramatic economic efficiency we have achieved technically through ephemeralization and this more with less phenomenon that shows statistically that we can create effectively a strategic abundance, a relative abundance that can take care of the human population. Something that I will address further at the end of this talk, there is absolutely no excuse for any human being on this planet to exist in the caustic condition of poverty or socioeconomic inequality, not in the 21st century. The operant idea here that I hope you all will take home is something coined by Norwegian sociologist and mathematician Johan Goltong, a term, the term structural violence, meaning preventable harm resulting from human generated institutions. It is an all encompassing kind of indirect harm that is seen as preventable once again. In our kind of localized sense experience, we tend to think of violence as a direct human to human affair, not a systemic outcome, right? And the following examples as related to poverty and socioeconomic inequality can rightfully be thought of in this way because they are systemic. They are still violence, but it's not a person putting a gun to your head. It's a person that has been troubled and abused throughout their life, exposed to terrible social conditions, put into a bad point in time where their violence is unleashed on you. You don't blame them necessarily or in total. You blame the social conditions that arrive. And that type of thinking is systemic, and that's the kind of thinking that defines public health today. And here are a series of examples that I think are important. As far as mental health, a study by researchers at Washington University, St. Louis in 2016, actually found that child poverty can alter brain connectivity, weakening important connections between regions, leading to clinical depression in adulthood. More broadly, a 2015 study focusing on 63 countries found that about 46,000 suicides were associated with unemployment in 2008 alone, marking a dramatic rise that was related to the global financial crisis. A report published by the American Psychological Association examining a database of 34,000 patients with repeat psychiatric hospitalizations found that unemployment, poverty, and housing unaffordability were correlated with the risk of mental illness. It stated, one of the most consistently replicated findings in the social sciences has been the negative relationship of socioeconomic status with mental illness. The lower the socioeconomic status an individual is, the higher his or her risk of mental illness. A lot of people like to reverse those things, and they assume that there's something wrong with people. That leads, no, it is causal in the other direction just as often. Similarly, an analysis by M.H. Brenner covering 120 years of data from New York State mental institutions found that instabilities in the national economy are the single most important source of fluctuations in mental health admissions or admission rates. As far as lifespan, a 2015 report from the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine found that an average lifespan difference of about 13 to 14 years between rich and poor exists in the United States. A more extreme example is the city of London, with the London Health Observatory concluding that a staggering 25-year gap of life expectancy existed between rich and poor. That's structural violence. In that context, we also have the prevalence of heart disease, which is not only correlated to poverty, but the broad stress of inequality in general. A study by UC Davis found that people with lower socioeconomic status had a 50% greater chance of developing heart disease. Using data from the United States, where over 600,000 deaths occur from it each year, the lead author concluded, low socioeconomic status is a heart disease risk factor on its own and needs to be regarded as such by the medical community. The power of stress is huge, huge in this regard, with economic stress naturally the most prominent for most people, as you would imagine, and I'm sure you sense, in your daily lives. Plaque builds up in the arteries from cortisol, leading to heart attack and stroke. T these stress hormones, uh, glutocorticoids and so on, they, they trigger immune processes that lead to these types of cardiovascular diseases because of the stress people experience in and of itself. In fact, psychosocial stress, 
meaning psychological stress coming from the social environment leads to, leads to brain damage. It leads to, of course, hormone problems, depression, anxiety, reproductive complications, sleep disorders, growth impairment, memory problems, diabetes, of course, cardiovascular disease, gastrointestinal disorders, sexual disorders, and overall immune deficiencies that open, to, open the door to a host of other diseases and complications. The effects of stress can also be long-term, such as child abuse. Various studies track childhood abuse stress to a numerous adult disorders, such as obesity and addiction. And this particular one here concluded, the study clearly shows that difficult life events leave traces which can manifest as disease much later in life. The mechanisms behind this process include stress, negative patterns of thought and emotions, poor mental health, increased inflammation, as well as lowered immune function and metabolism. Now, intuitively, one may counter-argue that incurred physical, emotional, and sexual abuse as a child has nothing to do with an adult's socioeconomic status, and hence class and inequality cannot be blamed. However, this argument holds little ground since the precondition of poverty has been found to be the largest predictor, the largest predictor of a physical, emotional, and sexual abuse as a child. Where exactly this socioeconomically triggered causality occurs in life doesn't change the fact that it has socioeconomic relevance. And as far as broad mortality itself, a 2011 study by researchers at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health found that factors surrounding poverty, lack of education, and racial discrimination are linked to the death of approximately 874,000 Americans in 2000. About 2.8 million Americans died in 2000, meaning 31% of the U.S. population died because of these arguably preventable circumstances, no doubt tied to income and loss of opportunity and the chain reactions of low socioeconomic status. However, it gets more interesting when you look at larger macro conditions. And this is a little bit of a, a detour, but I hope you can follow me. Globally, about 800,000 commit suicide annually, with many more attempted. 75% of those occur in low and middle income countries, with 30% occurring, uniquely enough, by pesticide self-poisoning. 30% by pesticide self-poisoning? Why? That's strange. This pesticide self-poisoning has become a powerful pattern in rural regions in the developing world. While part of a larger global pattern of farmer suicides, patterns in the global south have specific characteristics that link it directly to changes in international trade policy and effectively neoliberal globalization, economic roots. In fact, of all the variations of structural violence we could categorize, the economically induced mass suicides occurring by poor farmers who have lost their means of survival due to austerity, economic adjustment programs, trade policy, and ultimately the stress of debt is a unique example for sure. A study by a Mumbai-based Gandhi Institute of Development Research found that in 2006, 86.5% of farmers who took their lives were in debt. And then we have the broad issue of behavioral violence, something I'm not going to go into too much detail, as it's complex, of course. This isn't just about the deprivation of poverty. It's also about inequality and psychological distortions and a sense of shame that is created by feeling lower in status a detailed four-year study measuring the relationship between socioeconomic factors and gang violence in Los Angeles specifically concluded, at the community level, gang-related homicide in Los Angeles is most closely associated with lower income and unemployment. Seems obvious to us, but when you hear people talk about these things, they approach it from a free will standpoint, as the people that are in gangs just like to be in gangs. This is also interesting to note that given the political outcry to reduce gun violence in the United States, <clears throat> half of all violent crime in America actually originates from the 33,000 present gangs, mostly in the inner cities but beyond, according to the FBI as of 2011. Yet no one's talking about poverty or inequality control. In the words of Dr. James Gilligan of the Harvard Center for the Study of Violence, the former head, Worldwide, the most powerful predictor of the murder rate is the size of the gap in income and wealth between the rich and the poor. The most powerful predictor of the rate of national or collective violence, war, civil insurrection, and terrorism is the size of the gap between income and wealth between the rich and poor nations. 
In the work, The Spirit Level, Why Equality is Better for Everyone by Wilkinson and Pickett, something I've sourced quite a few times, if anyone has seen. A large amount of epidemiological data is explored and correlated. Societies with large income gaps, such as the United States, suffer disproportionately across a range of public health problems, including higher incidences of heart disease, obesity, infant mortality, homicides, imprisonment, teen birth, mental illness, education, and so on. This is the wealthiest nation in the world, right? And I'm going to stop there as far as examples. And really, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And anyone that tells you that class stratification is anything but a negative reality in our world is simply wrong. We are literally allergic to socioeconomic stratification and inequality as a society. It does nothing positive for us. Stark contradiction to people who say things like, oh, well, it helps innovation and so on, competitive innovation. You want to aspire to be that rich person. That's obscene, obscenely absurd. Poverty and inequality is an economic precondition simply for disease, violence, disorder, and lower public health. Now, to conclude this part, here is the empirical table of structural violence calculated by Kohler and Alcock in 1976, comparing global lifespans as a basis and using the countries with the longest lifespan as the benchmark. They calculated that up to 18 million unnecessary deaths occur annually. 95% of those deaths occur in the global south, showing the incredible disparity, of course, between the two hemispheres, as is still pretty much the case today. And it's quite startling, as it means inequality, inequality is really, systemically speaking, the leading cause of death on this planet. So what is the solution? How do we transition out of this ongoing public health crisis? known effectively as inequality driven by market economics and capitalism. This is a figure from the fifth chapter of the book presenting five economic transitions. Automation, access, open source, localization, and networked digital feedback. I'll appreciate patience as I go through these because it's going to be a little tedious. Each one of these represents a more efficient mechanism to achieve higher productivity, reduced inequality, and have the least amount of waste and environmental impact. If any of these changes were actually applied, you would see a relative general public health improvement and ecological improvement systemically. Interestingly, these five ideas are not obscure. They're not randomly idealized or pie in the sky. They're not pulled out of thin air. Anyone who's paid attention to current social and technological trends are aware of them, but likely haven't thought about their broader implications in terms of public health. I'll go through each one briefly. Automation, as we've already touched upon, this is perhaps the most obvious need in terms of the immediate need, I should say, as human employment is now inverse to productivity in the sectors where applied. It is not just a structural need to detach labor from income. It is also a social imperative. Given how integral it has been in generating this new level of efficient abundance, not to mention freeing the human being from drudgery and oppression, remember the greatest form of social oppression in human history has been the exploitation of labor, from slavery to feudalism to colonialism to capitalism. The battle between owners and workers, unions and companies, this would finally come to an end. Access. The second attribute noted refers to access versus property, by which I mean tilting the balance toward access and away from this ownership phenomenon. Ownership and property, of course, you know, are foundational to the market economy. And the idea goes back to folks like John Locke many, many centuries ago. However, things have changed once again, and our high technology society is now being hindered by the tradition of ownership, proving it to be wasteful and now impractical. From the standpoint of efficiency, the idea of everyone owning one of everything, as the market would like to assume, is irrational. For a species sharing a finite planet, not to mention completely and utterly unnecessary, it also promulgates a materialist conception of life, of course, which is really quite destructive to our social psychology. Perhaps the best example today of this is the slow inevitability that we see of shared automated car systems. It isn't difficult to see that even in our current system, how the idea of owning a car in the future might become impractical. One would simply call upon the car through an app or so on when needed in much the same way you see with things like Uber. It would be efficient enough and automated 
to the effect that it would be, again, impractical to sit and house a car. In 2015, there were 258 million consumer vehicles in the United States, yet the average use time is only 5%, meaning that, in pure abstract theory, only 14 million cars would be needed to meet demand versus 258 million. Again, this is another level of the phenomenon of ephemeralization, more with less, on a structural level. And this kind of strategic access can be applied to many other use needs in our lives without the baggage of ownership, improving sustainability, while also increasing access abundance. It also improve our psychology once again. Third issue, open source. The full incorporation of open source contribution, making all industrial and scientific information, scientific information freely available, could be deemed the cultivation of a collaborative commons. While we are taught that intellectual property is a driver of competitive innovation in the market, it doesn't hold a candle to the power of the group mind and the wisdom of crowds. It is the sharing of technological information in the long run that really creates our industrial technical process, not the hoarding of it. And if such a system of contribution was created properly, if we could create a technical means to engage not only design but the virtual testing, CAD and such systems, other advanced methods of prototyping in the virtual space, it could lead to a point where corporations really don't need to exist at all because it's networked, the relevance of corporate identity, the, the structure itself becomes obsolete when you can embrace the entire society for collective creative development. You simply connect the design systems to what will be increasingly, again, increasingly smaller industrial production complexes in the sense that we are seeing today with things like additive manufacturing and 3D printing. Hence again, ephemeralization applied to industry as a whole. And again, I apologize to move so quickly through this because it's a very interesting and nuanced subject, but due to time, I have to be general here. However, what this approach can enable is something really the world has never seen, a true participatory economy, which, by the way, really, really can only precede a true social democracy. The fourth issue is localization. Building upon this trend of ephemeralization, it is a natural progression to now relocalize industries. In stark contrast to globalization, localization is about regaining efficiency and reducing waste by locally producing as much as possible, streamlining the supply chain. Extraction, production, distribution, and recycling should be subject to design itself on the, on the highest level, organized in the closest proximity to the population in need. Today, the average American food plate travels about 2,000 miles before you eat it. That's a preposterous given the technological potentials we have now with numerous urban systems, vertical farming, modular, multi-purpose additive manufacturing. Again, we have the technology to now minimize the industrial process as a whole, not to mention bring back a community ethic that globalization is actually buried. And this also means decentralization, which has, of course, many positive features. Oceanic circles is why Gandhi used to refer to it because he was opposed to industrial globalization way back then on the premise that you have to have communities that have a local sense and extend out from there. And he envisioned societies of oceanic circles that layer across the world as opposed to centralized capitalist systems, which is pretty much what this phenomenon uh, that we have possibility of now can do. And the final transition is digitized network feedback. A primitive form of this, so to speak, is now referred to as the Internet of Things, which I'm sure many have heard. And it's about networking technology and sensors to optimize information flows rather than just rely on price. Today's economy is mostly driven by feedback from consumer purchases. People buy, business records this over the transaction, and production alters its designs and distribution to accommodate based on that feedback. It's a term uh, that someone named Ludwig von Mises coined years ago in opposition to anything of central planning and so on called the price mechanism. In the 20th century, price is now a very, very weak economic measure. In contrast, mechanisms related to this kind of so-called Internet of Things, the ability to connect everything and understand mass amounts of complicated information in a systems approach, obviously would be calculated by computers. We can monitor extremely efficiently consumer preference, 
demand, supply, planetary resources, labor value in terms of how difficult certain means are. And we can do this virtually in real time if a system was prepared. Everything is connected digitally so we know what we have and what we're doing. Imagine that. Much of this information, by the way, is pretty much non-existent today because corporations have proprietary restrictions on the information they have. We really don't know anything about the hydrocarbon state of this planet, for example. We really don't know how many particular ores or how many diamonds or anything because it's their privilege to hoard this information, release it more at their competitive advantage than to actually be truthful. But the real power of all this comes when you combine all the other things I've listed in this figure, automation, access, open source, and localization. You combine them into one synergy, one system. In other words, when people engage in open source, collaborative commons network, working design with each other, utilizing the group mind, that information can be linked to all of the networked feedback that we're getting from the sensors and the information in our environment. It's hard for me to explain that, but if you can imagine designing something where you have to ask the question, do we have an amount of this enough to, to work in this system, work in this product, that answer could be readily available through this type of interactive feedback system. Immediate state of resources, trends, possible scarcity, public use patterns, and so on. This is the fabric of a real economy, actually organizing and understanding what you're doing. And again, it's a large subject as extensively detailed in the book, so I'm gonna have to kind of leave it at that. In conclusion, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights states in Article 25, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, and other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. It's very easy for institutions like this to give lip service to how things are supposed to be in the hope for really what is a more egalitarian view of society with social justice. And as fundamental as this is, the truth is the economic basis of our society today completely works against the hope of any of that occurring. And if the trends stay the same, it's just going to get that much more distant to find balance and justice on the level of public health as time moves forward. I'm going to leave you with this, this disturbing chart which annotates seven negative trends, which in synergy by about 2050 will likely foment a new paradigm of social destabilization if the structure of our society, meaning of course the structure of our economy, does not change dramatically. And such changes, again, are no longer an issue of ideology. This isn't an argument towards what's good or bad or right or wrong, I should say. This isn't this isn't uh, freeing people from something. This isn't a Marxist perspective. This is an issue of public health and what is required to keep society with some form of stability as we approach nine billion people by 2050. And that ultimately is the new human rights movement, a movement to change the structure of our society, to improve our well-being before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you. So I know that was uh, a lot to throw at you guys, but please, sir. I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of global citizenship as a philosophy of looking at the world as a whole. And I was hoping you could uh, elaborate a little bit on perhaps building on, on the quote from the United Nations uh, uh, basis of uh, basic human rights. Uh, what are the basic human rights? access to food, water, shelter, and et cetera, and how that could be built upon in order to build a possible political party and structure for change that could be adopted worldwide. Well, the idea of a political party to try and move this forward is, of course, the most logical one. And if you mean on a global scale, obviously, that's very radical. I'm not aware of any global political parties. In terms of the United Nations and the ideals they promote, which you know, are all well-meaning, uh, they, of course, completely lapse any type of economic observation. I have a hard time, in the terms of activism, when I speak with people to try and you know, tell them what to do. I mean, I can give lots of suggestions on multiple levels, which are usually creative suggestions. But in terms of politics, 
until the until the perspective has been established that we can't really trust the political system until we collar the economic system and the power of money and business and that constant urge for domination, uh, we, there's very little hope in anything politically as this, in, excuse me, as far as this structure remaining because the influence is so strong. As far as global citizenship, and I identify, of course, with what you're saying. Can you clarify your question in terms of, of what exactly you're expecting as an answer? Because I'm trying to, I'm searching in my brain. Well, a new political party that would adopt this philosophy. Okay, well, sure. I mean, or that and in, in, in begin the transition of the economic system, you know, for example, the basic income, which is a, a popular topic nowadays and, and being tested in various pilot projects around the world. You know, the basic yeah. economy can be uh, redefined as first and foremost as identifying what the basic needs are and addressing those needs and letting businesses make money at providing those needs with, in cooperation with the government. <coughs> uh, yeah, well, that would be the traditional logic and I agree with that. But unfortunately, the, the structure of the system, as I point out, the business is always going to be opposed to anything that creates equilibrium because the very structure of business, whether it's on the social level or the ecological level. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not skirting around your answer. I mean, there, if, there are plenty, if someone wants to start a party that is in favor of this, that's great. But in terms of what I think is actually going to have to happen, it's going to be far more radical. It's, we, we have two different levels to you. Have, the ecological crisis is so severe that no one can hide from it. So it doesn't matter what one nation does progressively if, say, the United States and China and, and India and so on, if they continue the, the hydrocarbon stuff that they're doing, polluting the atmosphere disproportionately compared to the rest of the world and climate change and so on, then obviously it's a global initiative to, to, to approach these countries to get them to change their behavior. But in terms of larger structural change, in terms of what's, you know, what I think really has to happen is some country is going to have to go off the grid with the ephemeralization technology that I've spoken about. Just as your home can be now off the grid, if you're in a state that allows it, of course. But if, a, if you can get off the grid with your home, there's the same logic can be applied to a nation. So let's assume, like, uh, imagine if we were in a high technology world when Cuba was embargoed. Instead of Cuba having to deal with, you know, communist Soviet, excuse me, the USSR and all the, the, the tension and the military force, they actually just said, forget it. We're just going to engineer our own systems through modular technology. and and design systems, and we're going to create an abundance locally. If they had that potential back then, that would have been profound. And I think that's what, that's what some country eventually is going to do. So I, I wish I could pretend like I have all the answers, but I do think in, in, the sense of act, in the sense of transition, it's going to be more radical. It's going to be a nation that decides to do something literally different and put up walls, unfortunately, and defend itself as it completely changes its own social structure. And as we've seen, of course, historically, the major powers, empires, don't like that at all. So there's that influence. I mean, I can only imagine some country doing that and then the news reels in America talking about uh, all the human rights abuses of this new whatever socialist nation and so on, and then building that arsenal of propaganda and then invading and destroying the efficiency that they've created. These are all feasible things that could happen, but I, I'm at a loss to try and, you know, all I can hope, frankly, is that this information becomes logical and obvious enough that enough people galvanize around it and either they're able to change their, their local situation, which is probably the most distant, or they're able to, to come together and, and start something new somewhere and actually survive. Does that help? <laughs> uh, I'm, hopefully I won't be too far out of order here. I can't remember, I think you had your hand up right after him. I'll go, cut the, okay, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, first of all, for spreading this message. Uh, I watched your movie, your movie many years ago and I really like your stuff because it reinforces some of my own beliefs selfishly. Right on. Uh, so I'm very interested in finance, and I understand you have a background in finance. Um, and right now my current obsession is the blockchain and the potential that Bitcoin and an alternative financial world could bring and help us forge this kind of new social contract that you're talking about. Um, yeah, I, I think well, I, no, I've, we've had a lot of talk about blockchain. In fact, we're probably going to do a podcast for the movement soon on the subject. I appreciate blockchain. Uh, because obviously it removes intermediary people. It removes the need. It's another kind of ephemeralization once again. Instead of having lawyers and people and banks, you're able to get them out of the way through technology and suddenly you go peer to peer. And I'm all in favor of that. As far as the actual currency, well, currency is still currency and the economy is still the economy. There will definitely be positives, but I, I don't know. I'm not entirely clear on what, say, Bitcoin and, and the cryptocurrencies mean 
in the, at the end of the day, but I am very excited about blockchain as a, as a technology. And uh, again, we're going to do a podcast on it to try and get to the, the bottom of it. I think that in terms of connection of, tech, of, of information flow, and security, and what, what it implies, the, you know, the, the, the crypto part of it, the, the, that has many ramifications in terms of information flows that would remove possibilities of hackers, remove possibilities of interference in multiple ways that I think plague us society when we try to do something good, you know what I mean? You know, we always have that fear that of, of a vandal or somebody, I get this all the time if you talk about, say, digital systems, where like systems of design, someone invariably asks, well, what about the hackers? What about the people that are going to shut your system down? And blockchain seems to be a guard against that because of the way it has redundancy through the ledger and so on. I guess I'm interested if like, Bitcoin were to acquire a conscience, you know, if they were to kind of you know, promote a more sustainable way of doing business within the greater like... I'm not sure what the social psychology created by Bitcoin is yet. I just, our, our main website was just hacked by people that that used our server and people's computers to mine Bitcoin or mine a different coin. I mean, this is complete corruption. I mean, obviously that doesn't define it. But again, once you have any kind of monetary anything where people are struggling, you know, fraud and everything is just inevitable, which is why I really, as I didn't really touch upon in the lecture, but moving away from markets and currency and the whole system of markets obviously is where the society needs to head because it, that very mechanism of trade dominance and all the things that are reinforced psychologically, the scarcity basis that is that dollar, uh, that's what continues to plague us. And well, on, on, a localized blockchain, you would know the people you'd be trading with. Well, I'd hope that the blockchain, I don't, I don't want to extend the conversation too much, that's okay, but I'd hope that the blockchain in, in what it's merit, what it's proposing could be just as secure locally as it is globally. You know, that's what they imply. I mean, obviously these giant servers taking enormous amounts of power to process the thing, that's, that's an interesting issue. What if power went out <laughs> in certain areas? Obviously you'd hope the redundancy is strong enough that it goes to all sorts of other machines throughout the world. So anyway, that's, that's an extended conversation. I'm fascinated by it, is my point. And I think it's definitely a positive step. And you're Pat? Uh, you might have to like, Well, the, the current climate requires enormous amounts of money to do anything like that. So you, you, you don't have resource access without money right now. So unless you find... Uh, uh, like Bill Gates. Do you, you think Bill Gates and his values? Yeah, I know. I'm just saying, that, you know, if you can find the eccentric, multi-billionaire that wants to start a city, I'm, I'm, believe me, there's plenty of people that have brought that up over the years. Uh, my favorite idea, which is actually what actually came from it, it's, it's a fictional concept, but I, I like it, uh, was introduced by a, a pretty despotic character named Peter Thiel, one of the founders of PayPal, who is a rabid neoliberal free market guy. And he, he in this kind of Koch brothers mentality, they, they're so in, enraged and in such contempt that society has any social platform for welfare and trying to help people. They think it's all supposed to be survival of the fittest through your incentives and markets and you get what you are and it's scarcity, it's competition. They believe that so much that he's actually proposed building offshore islands and making an Ayn Rand fantasy where people could go and live in an island with no in international waters so they can live in their beautiful utopian market economy without the interference of the state. Isn't that great? I'm not kidding. That's exactly what he, you can look it up. It's called seasteading. So yeah, I mean, obviously what stops it, to answer your question, we don't have, we, no one, I don't know anybody that has the ability to do this. And the system obviously restricts it because you need the money to get things. Any like uh, update or correlation with like the Venus Project? Right? Since the death of Jock, I, I think that she's just giving tours and the information is there. I don't know of any developmental things happening. And to be perfectly honest with you, from my introduction to the Venus Project to you know, my disassociation with the Venus Project, of course I still appreciate all of it, is that they never had a plan. There's no plan. It, they, they, they have explicitly have stated that we are propose a solution, but we're not telling you how to get there because we don't know. The only thing that you'll hear is something along the lines of, well, we expect society to collapse, and then people will wake up, and then they'll do something new. Sadly, it doesn't work that way, nor would we want it to happen like that. Um, in fact, what you call collapse is a completely relative notion. Today, we have a billion people that are getting their needs met. As far as I'm concerned, that's societal collapse. That's global collapse right there. Um, you have, in, in America, 62% has less than $1,000 in savings. To me, that's a kind of collapse. That's a major public health issue. So what, you know, does everything have to be on fire? <laughs>
I don't, I don't know what collapse means anymore, frankly, but it can, you know, obviously things can get worse and worse and worse. Um, anyway. And the gentleman? Yeah, can you talk a little bit about uh, just what leadership looks like for this group? Well, leadership is a, is a unique uh, context because if you look at the world today, leadership takes a bad rap. We have a, we have a leadership in the current environment that is invariably corrupt because power is so associated to money and finance and property and the market game and competition that very rarely do you see someone in a position of leadership that didn't get there because of their fluency in being competitive and ruthless. Look at the president. So, I mean, in terms of leadership in this, well, I'm hoping that I spread ideas. I'm hoping that other people pick up these ideas and have a, an interest and see just the fundamental merit and necessity of it. And whatever organically is created, such as the Zeitgeist Movement, has been around for 10 years. We have chapters across the world. Uh, hopefully other movements will be created with different anglings towards this, because it's really a developmental process. I'm not, you know, I'm not arrogant enough to say that I've figured this all out. I mean, I have the, the basic logic is there, and I'm hoping others will build upon it. But I'm not expecting some political type of leader identity to come forward. You know, obviously, as this gentleman mentioned, if there's a political party that was actually, actually made it into the forefront, well, that would be tremendous with this type of value system. Uh, so leadership really comes from you. It comes from people that educate themselves. If, you don't, if you're following somebody and just say, oh, I like that person's ideas, that's not success. You gotta, you gotta know it. You have to believe it. You have to become you know, just another agent of the value system and the ideas. So in a certain sense, it should be a leadership, a leaderless, excuse me, kind of environment where the galvanization is just natural because people understand it and they all thrive towards a common end. Uh, back here in the blonde, sorry. Oh, so again, we're back to our conversation. I think that's my clarification. Sure. The farm suicides in India. Okay. You also mentioned that there's a lot of people who are not sure about pesticide poisoning. Right, which was the majority of the causes. No, no. These are people that had the Monsanto chemicals that after having a failed crop because of how bad the technology is, coupled with the fact they're in enormous debt because of the promise that these pharma, uh, these uh, big pharma, excuse me, big uh, agricultural companies made, uh, enormous amounts of debt was they to buy their seeds. So they went into a bunch of debt. They just drank this. The, they just drank it. That's how they killed themselves. Completely epidemic in India, at least in the last decade, it certainly was, and it's still. Oh yeah, no, they drank it often leaving behind, on average, four to five family members in complete destitution, which is a whole other level of the despair. It's a, it's a, you know, again, it's a systemic problem where you have a combination of cultural values, such as a man taking care of his family. And he's, you know, in, in India, that type of, those types of values are obviously there, just like in many parts of the world, traditional. And then this failure happens, he can't live with himself. So. But you still can blame the economic premise of neoliberalism and the fact that you know, all of these systemic, these people were fine before that. You know. Anyway, next, over here in the back. Yeah, um, I think um, the scariest thing that I've seen you doing is actually connecting that, uh, that initial moment with the Bonobo and uh, mm. the Champions Because if I get into that analogy, knowing that the Bonobos constitute 2% of the chimpanzee uh, compared to, I mean, the kind of, uh, of uh, progression of chimpanzees has been much greater than bonobos. It feels, and because of the environment that they have, it feels very scary to me that you, your ideas could be taken to work for only a very limited section of the world that well, might be then uh, sort of... You mean like an elitist... Example. Yeah, that, 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 yeah. Yeah, that, that, that this could become an extremely powerful kind of um, imaginary for a world that at some point consumes resources and then finds itself in the position of shifting towards abundance. Well, that's what I mean by like the Peter Thiel seasteading thing. Like these guys want to create completely energy efficient. I mean, it's been postulated. They're not doing it. At least I don't think they are. I think there was one construction a number of years back where they were trying this. But they, you know, these are giant man-made islands with solar power and wind farms and, and energy systems from the ocean. And they're basically, in a, in a way, to me, when I read all this stuff, it was at the, you know, the peak of you know, Occupy Wall Street. It seemed to me that they're just trying to figure a way to escape, <laughs> to put it but frankly. I, but, I'm going to, but that's the same technology, by the way. I'm going towards the fact that actually I, I think that 
in anthropology, what is always missing is that it's not only hunter-gatherers, but it's also fishermen. Oh, yeah. And what I'm saying here is that your idea actually about islands, it's not to be this, this dystopia is there, but there are islands like Cuba yeah, yeah. that are in the process of having to make a shift uh, from the kind of model that they've embraced for a number of years and resisted heroically within that model and in total isolation, however, might be in a position to receive your, your message or become something of that sort. And I'm saying islands, and I really mean islands, and I really see this as something with Polynesia and with many other islands. And I would think that this is actually something where you might want to, to think about how this is an approach that should really, uh, that could uh, begin from islands. Yeah, I, I could identify with that, absolutely. Because it's, you have everything kind of contained assuming that the base resources are there to incorporate the so ephemeralization? The identity politics of islands contain the <coughs> awareness and need of the other as both enemy and, I mean, the, the psychological tendencies that you're talking about are also inscribed within animals, which is not isolations, but it's a type of identity that is relational. I see what you mean. It's consistently that. Yeah. So the basis, the psychological basis might already be somewhat there. I'm thinking about uh, Puerto Rico, I'm thinking about Haiti, I'm thinking about islands where this kind of experiments might be tremendously important. I really hope someone takes it on in that environment, because the isolation of an island, as you point out, the psychology of an island, it's, it feels self-contained, it creates that identity of independence. And I, I think that, that you know, if, if they could acquire the resource and technological means, which I think, given another 15, 20 years, will actually be legitimately possible. Like, it will be blatantly obvious that localization is that feasible now. So I, I can only hope, and that's something, again, in, in an activist sense, these are the kind of projects that people should work on and advocate. You had a question? Hey, good to see you again. Yes, uh, nice to see you too. Yes, I've been following you through the years, and some of the, all these sociological studies that have been done, and the show the relationship of inequality and deprivation, all the negative consequences. And just when we see it flashed in front of us that five, six people have more than half the world. Um, and, and you've gone through the years of de describing how the supply of money is controlled, central banks, and, Whole, and yet it's yeah. accumulating in so few hands. And those people, when they accumulate this money, you've expressed how it becomes like a violent act against everybody else that is deprived of, of uh, because if we've controlled a certain amount of money and now we've uh, allocated it to, to just a few people, now suddenly all the value in the world that we place, despite the technological advancements, is unavailable for circulation. Well, in, the, in the book, I'm, I'm sorry if I didn't have interrupted no. you, but in the book I have an island example, which I think makes the picture very clear, and that's the, if you have an island of 100 people and everyone starts out with a certain amount of money equally and then through the market gaming process, and I detail a little bit more specifically, suddenly one person, and this is of course parallel to modern society, has 99% of the wealth. What do you call that? The person sitting on that one island where 99% have virtually nothing and one person has all the wealth. Is that, do they deserve that? <laughs> That's really an issue of violence to hoard that type of unnecessary amount of money as the term structural violence relating to inequality creates, yeah. And I think that's, a cycle, that's an important uh, ethical kind of consideration that no one really speaks of. Even people like Bill Gates, who probably does mean well, he, when, when approached by um, that famous uh, ec economist Piketty, who wrote Capital in the 21st Century, Gates responded by saying, well, you can't expect me to, to be taxed on my wealth because I do good things with my wealth, referring to his philanthropy. As though, as though the world's problems are going to be solved by the billionaires of the world now, as opposed to government. Because the whole point of government is the assumption that, yeah, you have a voice, uh, you, it's, you're participating in the design and the well-being of your society. And of course, through the, through the propaganda, everything from education to you know, taking care of territory, government continues to fail miserably because it has no support. I mean, what's the thing that just came out recently, the Paradise Papers? where all these the incredible tax havens have just been revealed of all these enormous wealthy celebrities, queens, and so on. So the, there's a tremendous indifference to a trying to help society built into the system. So you know, I'm sorry, I'm rambling a little bit. So the point being is that you have that value system, people don't realize 
that just the very fact that the system does this inequality, generating these immense divisions by these, all these systemic processes built in, that's the problem. And if you actually respect that, I find that to be deeply offensive. In fact, my kind of a joke, I say, well, if you're a billionaire and if you're not apologizing for being a billionaire, then your morality is, is dysfunctional. <laughs> because you, you just no one that deserves to have the kind of obscene wealth that some of these folks do. You can debate some people that have other projects they want to reinvest things into and they do good things, but not when you're talking about, you know, the guy that founded Amazon with 90 some billion dollars. What, do you comprehend how much money that is? That is a lunacy amount of liquidity. That is, that is the most offensive, I'd be the most offended person, I'd be the most offensive person, excuse me, if I had that kind of money, I would feel like shit every day. <laughs> I mean, that, that's how insane and just obscene when you look at the world and the destruction and the inefficiencies and so on. Anyway. Yeah, I was reading about him today, how he's acquiring the biggest building in, in Washington, D.C. Richard Branson owns his own yeah, island. Seattle. He's bought the properties around him to extend yeah. to a bunch of acres and all. And, yeah, I mean... Uh, this is still kind of limited, his own newspaper like, that he bought uh, in D.C. See, I, but I refrain from too much demonization of these folks because they're still victims of the society. They are so rewarded by this, their status. Look at Trump, man. Look at just the amazing psychology. He is the poster child because that childish, competitive, winning thing, that, that the dominance mentality, uh, always talking and that self-glorification, this is the dominant reward of... Uh, sensibility, I suppose, you could say that this society creates at the highest level. And the fact that he's president is the most amazingly perfect symbolic thing. I mean, it's absolutely perfect that the president of the United States, the, this kind of forbidden experiment, really, because that's what the U.S. is. It's the extremity of the worst over free market obsessed, free market, not to mention socialism for the rich, actual free markets for the poor, so to speak, and all of that dichotomy, because you know, none of it's consistent throughout. Uh, he's the absolute perfect uh, symbol of all of that. Anyway, I'll keep randomly. We've got uh, someone right here. Yep. Uh, I've been a fan for years. It's oh, thanks. Oh. I read the whole book. Oh, great. Um, so in terms of implementing these ideas, I don't see how it would not involve a political action sometimes, like this man said. Because if, if you're talking about violence, Still, the corruption at the top, if you don't that, yeah, I know. Let me, let me restate that because I, I think I come off wrong. I am in favor of humans coming together, sparking support, lobbying institutions to try and change the world. You can call that politics, the Greek definition. But the failure to me is, and I listened, you know, I was even in a, a conference in Washington with Jill Stein, and I was listening to all this rhetoric of the party identity and, and all this, this stuff that in, at, at the end of the day is so meaningless because their platforms are not wide enough. And my biggest objection to politics, just to clarify, is that it's just not honed in as an institution and is forever corrupt by money. So I completely agree with you, though. There should be some type of gathering of folks that use the process but I, I just have a, a cynicism towards it because once you get into that world, the amount of money that's required, for example, to even start something like that is astronomical. And once you bring in investors, so to speak, to do that, that's when the pollution begins. And I think that's why even like the Green Party and all these other institutions, they're constantly either shut down and pushed down or, or they don't even or they get corrupted because once the big money comes in, it starts to dominate because everyone's in fear of, of making, excuse me, offsetting the people that are financing them. So there's that natural kind of synergy. Um, so I, 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 I agree with you, in other words. I mean, I, I could ramble on all sorts of nuances about that. I mean, the Zeitgeist Movement is different in the sense that it's attempting to just galvanize from an educational standpoint. I couldn't imagine someone starting a party on behalf of it, but I certainly wouldn't object to it. Um, I don't know. The closest thing that we had that could have paved the way for something new was Bernie Sanders. And Sanders, of course, was screwed from the very beginning. There's no way any of the major industrial financial capitalist folks were going to allow this guy to get anywhere near, and hence the corruption of the DNC and so on. If he had actually made it, as opposed to his diametric opposite, Mr. Trump, then there might have been grounds for a new conversation about what it means to actually have a systemic relationship of society where people actually have a dividend of what the efficiency of our society is, excuse me, what our efficiency of our economy is doing, where we can have social programs, we can have universal basic income and all of those things that are desperately needed. 
So yeah, in other words, I agree with you. <laughs> I just hate the political system as it exists, I should say. Bernie hasn't given up. <laughs> oh, I know. But I mean, people say to me, oh, but Bernie almost made him. Like, but why didn't he? And that's, that's the reality. Why didn't he? I'd be curious to see what happens next time, because I assure you there'll be numerous corrupt factors that push him as far as back as they possibly can. Because again, he represents, to a certain degree, the antithesis of everything this model represents. You in the back? Uh, so they, so thank you for your work. Oh, sure. What have you found that's effective to, to try to figure out what I can actually do? Uh, that's why I came here. What, what have you found effective to get people to, I mean, in a way, it's changing the culture of people thinking more functionally and relevant to their health? Because, I mean, I see us. And still just monkeys. I mean, we have a lot of these concepts and beliefs that's been able to create society, but when it comes down to it, as a species, uh, we're destroying ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. well, I'm sorry, what's your question? A question yeah, exactly. Uh, what, what have you found effective to be able to get some okay. address their health and then extend that into their own environment and other people's health? Well, I, in a lot of ways, a lot of the information I just presented is it's an, edu it's an edu educational imperative to, for people to realize, as I talked about at the very beginning as well, the, the behavioral biology and the sociological nature, the biopsychosocial phenomenon that defines you. And that's unfortunately a difficult thing to communicate because it's you know, not readily obvious. But if people do realize that about themselves, if you do realize that you're not this free will agent and that you've been defined by your life experience and the, you know, the stressors that you've happened in childhood and so on. You're defined by all of the environmental influences, both physical and, of course, the people around you, your sense of confidence, your support, your lack thereof. You know, all of that forces a certain autonomy uh, that forces you, excuse me, that moves you in a way that is not based on any kind of free will. And that, if there's anything I could say to you that if you could work on communicating with others, as I just <laughs> attempted to do, it's that. Because there's nothing more paradoxical and nothing more systemic, uh, enlightening in the systemic sense than realizing that you're not exactly in control of anything. You don't know everything. You can't make proper decisions. The brain doesn't remember everything you've been taught. There are the stressors and the hormones and the cortisol. You, you blink or out things. You have cognitive biases. And that's why the public health model is so important. And when you realize that you're this intermediary figure, when you realize like the, the guy that shot everybody in Texas or the person in Las Vegas or the phenomenon of, of terrorism, you know, all of these are intermediate figures. They're intermediate in the sense of the actions moving around them. Does that make sense? You're part of a causality. Um, and that, that's a very hard thing to get across. But if you can, then that really supports the public health model because people become so much more vulnerable and more compassionate. You know, instead of looking at somebody that just killed a bunch of people and say, oh my God, look at that evil person, let's immediately kill them. No, you say, what the hell happened to this poor person? You know, there's, clearly they're not having fun when they blow their brains out after they kill a bunch of people. You know, the whole phenomenon, in fact, I'd like to mention just as an aside, there's a great book called Heroes by Franco Berardi, which attempts to, it's called Heroes, Suicide and Mass Murder. And he attempts to try to figure out what is, the, what are the patterns that surround a lot of the, the rampaging uh, murderers, the ones that, spontaneous killers, not serial killers, but spontaneous killers, you know, the Batman guy, or of course the things that we've just seen, or Columbine. And he finds that it, there's a fundamental root of, of shame and people that feel like they're losing. And that, again, going back to that Trumpistic sense, you know, he's always winning. He's always, I like winners. He's, again, it's emblematic of this social distortion. And what he found and what he proposes, and I denote this in the book too, is that in the neoliberal order, in an order that's defined by competition, the first thing that you realize is that you're alone and that you're on your own, basically, in principle, in the theory of it all. And it's up to you to win. It's up to you to strive. And you're the one that's at fault. You're the author of your own poverty or success. And when people sense that and they get so beaten down, they have to figure out a way to win or make themselves feel in control and empowered. And the final result of that is to just kill a bunch of people and kill yourself. And it's a consistent pattern that you see throughout all of these circumstances. Like this, why? I mean, think about it, just why? And that it makes perfect sense. So on a, on a fundamental uh, public health level, I, I, and I, I agree with it. It's a speculative assumption, but I think it makes great sense. If you don't have basic support and you have no sense of meaning, as, as say, you know, James Gilligan denotes in his work, the, 
the researcher on Harvard, uh, excuse me, Harvard researcher on violence I mentioned, that it's the shame that triggers these really despotic and antisocial behaviors. Because people don't feel self-worth, and they don't ver therefore they don't value anybody else. They don't feel like they're identified, they're ignored. And I, I think, the, again, going back to my larger point, that the biopsychosocial nature of realizing that you're a part of this chain of causality uh, allows you to, to understand yourself better along with all the other social phenomena around you that otherwise you would dismiss as some kind of random event and so on. So I've deviated ridiculously from your question, <laughs> but, I, but it all inter interweaves into the sense of education. And I think if you could take that with you, where you try to talk to people that that they are not in control, that the illusion of free will is persistent, and that, you, and that it's not a bad thing, it's that you have to have that nuanced understanding of yourself and each other, that you, the higher order structures, the life experience, all the things that surround you are dominating and controlling you in ways, and if you want to change people, you have to change those higher order structures, both in the short and the long term. So in a sense, making the human species the inclusive Absolutely, inclusive to nature, and in, I hate to say a Newtonian sense, but you know what I mean, cause and effect, something that humans have a big problem with. I mean, religion has created the illusion that people are special and that they have free will on one side, but yet there's, there's divine plan on the other. Completely schizophrenic, you know, schizotypal type of worldview. And then you couple that in with, you know, the, the general idea of, of, again, this morality, ethics of free will that we see through all Western philosophy. I don't know of any Western philosophy, really major philosophers that really get to the heart of the systemic nature of humans and their influence. It's all about how you do it. Oh, you got to impose. If you, you know, it's all the, the. If you do something bad, it's your fault. Well, say that. Tell a drug addict that. You know what I mean? Drug addicts are completely aware <laughs> that what they're doing is detrimental to their behavior, but there is a compulsion that's created that over, overwhelms their free will because of generally a gen sense of pain, suffering, stress, and so on. So anyway, I could ramble on and on. Um, I hope that helps, by the way. Um, who have it? Someone that's new, they've got a couple people. You had your hand up before, didn't you? No. Okay, I should. Uh, yes, I just thought that just made me think about what are your thoughts on in-group, um, interrupting that in-group mindset where cognitive dissonance sort of takes over when you're discussing with people changing their perspective? Yeah, that's a horrible one. Oh yeah, I mean, how much? Yeah. It seems like we need to put something in place that gives them a, a, a home to go to or something to go to other than that in-group that will support them because survival-wise, you don't want to leave your, your in-group. Even if it's an abstraction. You know, look at the rise, like the Charlottesville, the, the racist uh, stuff, and their, their, their in-group is really just an internet cult. You know, they're not even, they're not even really seeing each other. So the, I, I mean, you know, I've talked about Robert Spolsky a lot, and he does great research in biochemical reactions for in-group, out-group reactions, cortisol, and so on. And it is a part of our evolutionary psychology, as I mentioned. It, there's something about us that gravitates towards whether it's, you know, the fact that we're raised in families and we protect our family, and then the tribe, and then, of course, the nation. I mean, nationalism is an abstraction. We don't know everybody in our nation, so how do we judge that we actually like them? You know, and then, of course, you have the antagonism that's created I, I have a, that's, that's a hard one. The only thing I can think of in terms of trying to resolve that is educating people to realize that it's destructive for one to have that, as again, as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, you know, in an age of technological warfare and biotech and nanotech and nuclear weapons, this type of divisive in-group mentality no longer is, is, uh, has the kind of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, it's not innocent anymore. Because that kind of mindset, I mean, just look at, look at North Korea and, and the United States and just that raw antagonism, which is mainly theatrics, but still, it, it, what it hints at is so catastrophic because of this complete delus delusional view that one group is all sick and distorted and an enemy of the other group. And that incorporates to everything. I mean, I'm, I, I frankly, and I've gotten a lot of criticism for this with friends of mine, I am a fr I'm pretty much disgusted by any type of group association. <laughs> And I mean that in the sense that I don't like seeing, well, but see, I don't think about it as, as that. I think about it as a train of thought that people subscribe to. I don't go up to TZM members and say, oh, you're in TZM? Oh, I must like you. No, sometimes that's not the case. 
So, you know, I, 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 I'm a little, but you know, when I see parades and marches for different groups, okay, I understand on one level you have activism that had to generate, and you say, well, we have to bind together to try and get our rights as a group, whether it's, you know, whether it's race, whether it's gender, whether it's creed. What's that? It is, and then suddenly group identity becomes its own force. And, I, and I, that to me, I think, at the end of the day is destructive. I don't know the answer to that because you do need an activist sense group inclusion that generate power to show force against oppressors. But it, 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 it's that, it is, as you said, it's a catch-22. And I think it's a, an issue of education, ultimately. There are no groups. I often fantasize about an alien finally coming down and threatening everyone. So finally, people say, oh, we have to actually work together. <laughs> You know, but I think that same logic can apply to things like natural disasters and so on. You know, that's really the enemy of humanity. So for uh, climate change, global warming, that really is, is something that the Earth, human species, the group, should start to work and unify towards. Of course, yeah. No, it's a, it's a nasty problem. And as I said in, in, the, in the presentation, you have to create structures that reduce that propensity. And right now it's the exact opposite. The entire economy is based on individual and group antagonism. The idea of unity and everything else um, is considered like a failure of somebody, you know, going back to, again, Trump rhetoric or all the propaganda against socialism and communism and its theory and so on. The idea of just caring about somebody else is considered weak, you know what I mean? Anyway, that's a, that's a big subject and a fascinating one, too. Uh, the groupistic stuff is, is very stressful to think about because it, it's like a polluting, it's just a disease, in a sense, that we have to overcome. And whatever its evolutionary basis was long ago to keep survival going, you know, I'm sure it had its use, but. All right, uh, you that's in the front here, I'll get to the back. Hi. Uh, so I do have a question, but uh, prior to that, I just, uh, if it's all right, I kind of wanted to add to the uh, getting a point across. Was it the previous question? Sure, the one I failed miserably at answering. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, well, uh, what came to my mind when I was thinking about it is, uh, even though you didn't talk about like a, a sense of unity, is like you know we're all kind of in this like it's like a human approach, like, like we don't really all have our own uh, free will. There's also you kind of have to appeal to their nature, and you did kind of talk on religion to a point. And what I would say is uh, what I said one time, which kind of stuck with me because I was like really proud of it, I guess in a way, uh, was uh, Christians in particular will preach about forgiveness and say like to be like Jesus Christ, like you know forgiveness is. Important, but uh, what I try to throw in there is it's impossible to understand true forgiveness outside the realms of environment condition. Does that sound like? Uh, Could you give me an example of what you mean? I mean, I, I think I get the gist of it. I mean, in general, that's, that's just it. I mean, I'm getting people to understand that they're a victim of their culture, right? Yeah, is that what you're saying? Say yeah. Not, um, like I, I don't want to say that I forget everyone for everything they do because I am compelled to by my religion. I should forgive everybody for everything they have done based on the concept that it's not within their control. It's partially in their control, I think is a more accurate way to say it. When people, when people you know, children, there's, there's a reason why kids born into, into a, say, a Christian environment and an Islamic environment grow up as Christians in Islamic. It's, they, no one that's born into a Christian family suddenly gets up and goes out and becomes back as, as, in, as a dedicated Islamist. Uh, because it's a completely cultural phenomenon. I look at it as just clothes people wear, frankly. But at a certain point in adult, adult life, even with all the pressures, all the, all the normalizing that's happened with someone's identity, which is difficult to overcome, there's a side of people that should be able to rationally think themselves out of it. That's why we have that prefrontal cortex. That's why we can, we can think as opposed to our primate species, which very much are bound, primate brethren, I should say, that are very much are bound by these impulsive reactions, and they really aren't conscious. Uh, that's an element of the human species that definitely makes us unique, which is another great argument against people that throw out, you know, bogus human nature claims. They just say, well, this is the way we are. And I say, well, this is the way we can be. And there's a great versatility. So maybe that can be useful too. But yeah, be having compassion for folks, even if they're of the most, you know, distorted form, you have to realize they're still a product of something. No one comes out of anything. And even if their biology is distorted and they have psychopathic or sociopathic genetic biological propensities, that still has its factoring of compassion, you know. Uh, but we, have, uh, well, we already had you. I'm trying to get the new, with the glasses? Yeah. Hey, uh, also wanted to thank you for coming in. Sure. Um, I also work with people on health-related field, doing body work and personal training stuff. Nice. Yes. One of the things that uh, 
I see you get from this is that you're trying to promote an understanding of relativity with our environment and with ourselves, where we came from, um, the resources that we use. Uh, it seem, seems like that's kind of the point of this, is to just under, introduce a perspective so that people can apply that template to whatever field they're in and then try to expand the consciousness of that. Uh, of their sphere of influence. Is that, is that intentional? Or I, I don't know if it, I, I haven't thought about it that way. <laughs> but I, I think uh, naturally I hope everyone that believes in a larger, a larger need for change, um, not only on behalf of themselves, but on the integrity of the future and so on, would incorporate that into whatever they're doing. Like when I speak with people that are younger and they're going into school and I hear that they're you know, going into banking or going into you know, something, or advertising, Jesus. Uh, you know, these are completely useless fields, except for making money. Uh, people should be going into programming. People should be going into design science. They should be going into biological and actual physical science. There should be something that has an actual contribution, not something, of course, that you just want to make money at. Yeah. So I, yeah. So science pretty much should be pretty important. Anyth well, engineering. I mean, whatever, I mean, science obviously is a huge umbrella. But yeah, obviously. I mean, you could, I mean, on some really sick level, you could say advertising is a science. Yeah, it's a science of manipulating people, science of manipulating their social inclusion and their, their natural kind of groupistic gravities and their, they manipulate their conformity. Uh, but <laughs> it's not a very good science, or a positive science, I should say. Yeah, so this is all kind of subversion in the way, trying to subvert the general paradigm to do a... Oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes, I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> So let's see, uh, well, it's funny because I have one of those useless business degrees, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, part of the reason I found you so compelling was because you do point out all the flaws of our current economic you know, paradigm. Um, so I have two questions. One is, is it more effective to appeal to you know, current status quo apologists to know the current system? Um, and the second part of my question is, you know, would you, is there anything that you would keep? Because um, I think you're, you know, thank you so much for your work, you've changed my life. And you're so great at pointing out the faults, which are, you know, they're, they're empirical, you can see them. But is there anything that you would keep, uh, like anything in our current system that, that people herald as, you know, you know, be all, because it seems when you criticize it, they go to this dichotomy. Of, well, if, if you don't like our system, then you're a communist. So, I mean, right. I just want to know if there's anything that you... Well, your first question about approaching apologists, like the higher high priests, the, the gatekeepers of the system, the people whose values are so entrenched, those are the ones I actually don't approach. Because you, you're, those are the most indoctrinated. And you, just like talking to a religious fanatic, it doesn't matter what you say. It's the rational thought can't break through the identity that's been created. So it's really, you know, the people that are more vulnerable. As far as your, uh, as far as your other question, you know, obviously there are plenty of things that are good in society. I don't know. I, I, it's not, I mean, the fruits of technology have produced plenty of wonderful, communicative, positive health things. It's just, it's, it's constantly surrounded by all the other social distortion and bad techniques, wasteful practices, and, and the litany of market externalities that I've talked about. I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss of trying to pinpoint any particular outcome that I think would be typical of this society versus another, if that's what your question is. I mean, uh, like, let's take something like competition. Competition in our society today, sports competition, uh, is what, what does it mean to be, to be engaged in that kind of act with somebody? What does it really imply? On one superficial level, it means you're trying, to, you're trying to affect your sense of confidence by beating somebody. That's effectively what it is. And I, I was in a very competitive music environment, and that actually happened as well. People would practice, and they'd try to develop musical pieces that were more complex than others. It's just an unfortunate kind of psychology, and again, completely reinforced by the system that people were born into. But at the same time, what really it does, it's a kind of learning, because our brains are wired to learn from each other. So when I see you do something that's phenomenal, physically, mental, it tells me that there's a chance that I could do that. And the, the mirror neurons, in fact, in your brain start to rewire and try to anticipate or try to expect the, your body to be able to do, some, do things like that. It's a very unique uh, feel. You like it, you, I don't know, there's, I don't like going a long tangent of it. But within the competitive element, there is a positive development of the individual, but it's not about the competition. It's about recognizing what people can do and then realizing that you have a possibility of doing that too. And I think that's how learning progresses 
uh, on a biological level is that when you witness something, for example, if I was to learn um, and study yeah, again, as a musician, I had teachers for you know, decades and they stand right by you and it's a completely physical interaction. It has to be because it's that, it's that actual engagement of another human being that creates the learning process. And I think that's where a lot of the striving that people say, well, I, I really did great as I competed with this person. What they're really saying is that I was able to watch them do something and I was able to adapt to that behavior much more rapidly because of the engagement than it would be if I was just alone trying to perfect myself. So that's an element of our society that has created progress, so to speak. I mean, negative things too, I, I, I qualify that term. Does that make sense? So that's something I think uh, should be understood better. And obviously in personal development, whether it's mental skill or physical skill, the, that doesn't, doesn't need to be competitive, but witnessing people and making that comparison, but non-competitively, that would be the more appropriate adaptation, I should say. And I hope that does, of course, stay with us. And I think it does naturally. I think people are always going to kind of be like that. Uh, there was, make sure there's no one else. Who haven't I talked to yet before we repeat for the folks? There, oh, right here, I'm sorry. This is a little bit back checking, um, but do you have any ideas for how we could implement the universal basic income given the flow of money that's going on right now? Like, do we yeah. Go yeah. Do we go inside job or do we go outside job? There's a, whole, there's a podcast that we did last month. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think because you have all the billionaires realizing that their security is in jeopardy, <laughs> uh, behind all the well-meaning rhetoric um, of, of Branson and Musk and Zuckerberg and so on, what it really is is their intuition that something has to happen because the inequality is just going to keep growing and it's going to create instability. So let's throw the public a bone. Let's give them some subsistence before they come after us with pitchforks. Um, but uh, beyond that, and I, 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 that's, that's the top level kind of intuition of folks like that, and I think the establishment realizes that too. Um, even people like Clinton have brought this thing up, so it's, it's moving very rapidly. Uh, how it would be implemented, I, I think it's going to be implemented by the, the, by, the, by the actual force of technological unemployment. I think that's the core motivation. I think the public health revelations are great, and I think we should have those. That awareness should be motivating, but you know, as with anything in this society, public health is a secondary concern unless it's going to create violence that interferes with the establishment. Um, but yeah, I think technological unemployment is the key to that. And so the more that ramps up, the more the only solution within this system will be that. And I think it's going to happen eventually. So really just educating people and then kind of be trying to make it happen. I, I mean, I, I'm referring to the force of the fact that our economy is going to be weeding out human labor by the force of cost efficiency because it's going to be cheaper to use machines than it is to use people over time. And all it takes, like for example, I saw an interview with uh, the owner of Starbucks. He's like, we will never automate our stuff. We want humans there. And I, I laughed because the moment any of their competitors develop a fully automated system that is going to produce things more cheaply and have more clientele, because I don't know if you've been to a Starbucks, but it's a nightmare because the poor people that are hung over are standing there, you know, getting paid nothing, miserable, <laughs> trying to pretend to be happy when the boss is around. Uh, eventually, I mean, I, I love, I, I envy, or I, see, I, I wish for the moment I can go into a restaurant and not have someone wait on me like a slave, because it really is an echo of a, of a form of servitude. But anyway, I, th I think it will happen by the force of that. And obviously, education is good too, especially for the public health things that I've mentioned. The more, that's the intermediate step of improving public health. If, if we alleviated technical poverty through universal basic income, it would be the first kind of... Um, the first empirical study, so to speak, on a, on a large scale, which has already been done, it's already proven really, that would say yes, removing socioeconomic inequality and bringing people into poverty clearly is extremely advantageous to the whole of society. And so that would be a, a great revelation, something that hasn't happened before. And of course, it also says, just to keep going, that we have an inefficient market system that is dysfunctional. And it will be, instead of welfare where people are put down because they're lazy and the welfare queens and so on, it's a completely different logic that says society is efficient, here's the dividend of how good we've become in our efficiency and production economically on the technical level, so here is your, here's your payment. And that's a completely different place to be. It's not derogatory. All right, uh, let's start with you here, then we'll go back there. To just uh, in having these discussions with people about this direction, I get a lot of people saying, well, can't we save capitalism through regulation and uh, putting these external um, economic externalities or these negative externalities in the cost of production? 
mm. and make these corporations pay for it. Won't that save capitalism? I, I would like you to speak on why that's not enough. And, um, and also I want to know what you think about the, the um, direction of Ubuntu with the one town uh, direction for how to, to make this spread throughout the world. If you think that's a good... Ubuntu, right. I'm not as much familiar, honestly, with that one. I have it, it's been presented to me many times, but I apologize for my ignorance. Yeah. As far as the, the issue of, I'm sorry, we're gonna go on? One, one final sure, go ahead. <laughs> I just wondered if you would give us like a, a sort of a fantasy scenario of how this would all evolve, best case scenario. Okay. And in other words, the movie. So I heard three questions. The first is, what's the problem with people trying to collar capitalism? And that, problem is is just what you see it's like holding up a river it's like holding up pieces of cardboard trying to dam a river well well but they're not able to do it because the force of that river is so strong that if someone came in like a Bernie Sanders posed strict FDR regulation just a matter of time before another administration comes in and completely unravels it just as Bush did just as Trump is doing right now with almost everything so it's an ebb and flow because the market system the incentives are always going to push against anything that's creating security on a so-called socialist level it hates that as we see from the rhetoric of the Koch brothers and so on as far as the negative externalities being being brought into price that's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked that because I was going to put in this presentation, apart from my study that there's 5.3 trillion in externalities that are unaccounted for that are being paid by everybody else and their health in the fossil fuel industry, a study was done on the top 20 regional resource industries like coal, uh, lumber, and what they found, these are enormous, massive uh, industries that support just about everything from buildings and they found that the top 20 of these, which represents, again, an enormous amount of GDP of this country, none of them would be actually profitable if they had to account for any of their externalities. So in a way, what you're doing is you have an ecological debt that's being created, that's being pushed into the future. To do that would shoot us to a... Oh, it would be, if you actually did, no. Well, I, well, it would bankrupt the entire planet in abstraction is what it would do uh, in a monetary sense. And as far as a fantasy, Scenario. Well, what I, the, the, the two routes ultimately is you have a galvanization of people through political means, come forward, be able to influence, get people in power. The pressures of the environment are strong enough where people are motivated and they realize they have to change. And suddenly you have a slow transition. Universal basic income happens. Suddenly we, we are able to generate food for free in certain regions. Suddenly you get off the market system. You start to create actual uh, social structures that support society in a truly democratic sense, in a truly egalitarian, open sense. That's a basic step by step. You, 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 you could do that too, absolutely. And you slowly work to move away from the competitive market into a system that's actually working together. And it's really kind of a fundamental socialist conception, even though it's different because in socialism, or at least the, the, the Western view of socialism, by the way, socialism, what socialism is really defined as participatory control that means production. And unfortunately, that definition is long lost in the way people use that term. Uh, and in a lot of ways, what I've just presented could be considered socialist. I consider it just really a democratic system. You're just extending democracy into the economic sphere, which has to really happen. But, in, but the label is socialistic. But in the, tense, in the sense of way, like the standards that says, okay, we're going to socialize health care. We're going to subsidize it. We're going to have people pay a small fee. And then they get, they get their health care without uh, the extraneous costs. That could happen as a step-by-step -step process. And then what you do is government takes something like healthcare and instead of using private industry, it starts to employ people directly and build its own system. And effectively society building its own system of healthcare. And that everyone's basically a part of that. And that, again, that, it takes the socialist label, but that is really the, the, the method to do that in this system. Now that would be a step-by-step -step process that I don't anticipate, at least not in any clean way. The pushback we see right now, especially in the United States, just for the most minor of things, is so astounding. Um, obviously, in the social democracies of Europe, you have a whole different stage. And in, in you know, the Nordic countries, they've, you know, they have much higher public health because they've implemented these things. So the evidence is there, and the trend is there. But I think as time moves forward, especially with the ecological crisis and the disturbances that are going to create, such as the fact you have these wars, you have resource wars eventually, water will be scarce by 2060, two-thirds of America, two-thirds of the world will be in water-stressed areas by 2030, actually. 
and all of the pollution, the, the 63 million refugees we have that are being pushed out of regions for multiple reasons, partly you know, the war-torn areas, but also the fact that you have destabilization happening environmentally. Once those pressures happen, the hope of any kind of fluid, nice, lovely move into a balanced society become that much more doomed. Because the stress, that's the, my biggest fear ultimately, is that we're going to hit that point of so-called no return, where you really can't begin a clean transition. It's going to have to be abrupt. And that brings me to the other poss possible scenario, which I already talked about, which is someone goes and just gets off the grid as a civilization and has the resource and technology to do it themselves and just gives a middle finger to the rest of the world and says, leave us alone. We're going to develop this. And then from there, it starts to spread. And good luck with that. <laughs> but it's not out of the question. I'm tapping before 100 years ago. 